<laughs> Morning, everybody, or early afternoon to everybody. I'm <laughs> We're going to give a few, a couple minutes before we like officially start uh, doing the welcome. So uh, we'll just hang out for a little bit. But thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Brandon Fairchild. I'm the National Membership Chair for the Fraternity. Um, we're super excited about this event. I hope you all are excited uh, and not terribly stressed out. Uh, I know a lot of you are probably dealing with finals week or other people in your chapter are dealing with finals. So I'm sure you're kicking butt with all of that. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll be with you guys in just just a couple minutes. For those of you that may be new to Zoom, if you are joining us on a desktop computer or something of the like a laptop, your control panel will likely be at the bottom of your screen. If you're tuning in from something like an iPad or an iPhone, this may differ or an Android device. But if you are on a computer um, or otherwise, go ahead and navigate to your control panel to get familiar with those controls you should be seeing a mute and unmute button, a stop video button. Um, along the way, you'll see a breakout room button, you'll see the chat feature, and then of course the end or the leave button to come in and out of the session. If you happen to need to leave along the way to uh, grab some lunch quick and come back, or for whatever reason, you can always pop back in by navigating to that Zoom link that you were sent in the confirmation email after you had registered. If you added it to your calendar, that Zoom link is on your calendar invite. That will be your access to get back in here. Um, we're gonna have alternating hours of educational sessions combined with collaborative hours, and you've likely uh, already seen that from the registration form, but we're gonna get to alternate to hearing from some alum, other peers of the fraternity in their area of expertise, and then you all will get to collaborate during offset hours through roundtables, fellowship events, et cetera. So I hope you all are excited to be here. We have a wonderful crowd joining us. We're already up to 88 per well, excuse me, participants. So whether you're tuning in in the morning, afternoon, whatever it is, thank you so much for being here. We are excited to get rolling in a minute. All right, hey, are you ready? You good? All right, fantastic. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone, again. Uh, uh, I'm coming to you from Hawaii, so you'll see the sun rising in the back behind me. So uh, we say aloha mai kako from here, uh, which means greetings, everyone. We're super excited to have you. We have almost 200 people who've registered for this event all across the country. Every single region is represented. We have um, tons of, obviously, tons of students, lots of alumni, section chairs, some region chairs here, so it's a, it's a really good group and we're excited. Uh, my name is Brandon, again, uh, I'm the National Membership Chair for the Fraternity. Uh, I'm actually going to turn it over right now to uh, Tara Brooks, who's the chair of the branding subcommittee underneath the membership committee. She's going to give everybody a good welcome today. Uh, uh, started in the first 
All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I hope you are having a great morning or afternoon, wherever that is for you. Um, and we are going to go ahead and just go over a general overview of the day and different reminders to have as we start this event. So first of all, just a general overview of the day. Marissa covered most of it. We're going to have different hours where we're doing trainings that will be really valuable as you're creating your recruitment program for the spring. And then on the opposite hours, we'll be having what's called collaboration hours. And there's gonna be options for roundtables on a variety of topics and populations. And there will also be opportunities for fellowships. And then at any point that you would like to collaborate with your chapter or with other people that you meet in these different events, um, feel free to let us know and we can create a breakout room for you to go ahead and get together. So um, Marissa is going to go ahead and drop a link to a survey in the chat. And this is super helpful for y'all to be able to fill out and you're going to create your schedule for the day. So any event that you are interested in attending or you think you would like to attend, go ahead and fill that out when you get that chat. And that way we can go ahead and make sure that you are good to go and your schedule will be smooth for the day. And then for this process to work best, we want everyone to be participatory in the trainings um, and with different events that they're going to. So if you are a write everything down person, have your pen and paper ready. If you're more of a digital person, have a Google Doc open, whatever that looks like for you. And we hope you get a lot of value out of these trainings. At any point, if you want to meet with one of us, so one of the volunteers, someone on the national office staff like Marissa, um, go ahead and chat the word SUPPORT in all caps, and that will let us know that you want to meet with us on spring recruitment plans or anything recruitment related coming to the season. Um, and so this can happen at any point in the conference. Just type the word SUPPORT in all caps, and we'll remind you of that throughout the day, so don't get stressed out about remembering that detail. Um, if you want a collaborative space, like I said, for your chapter or for anyone you meet to work on your spring recruitment plan or continue you a conversation at any point you can request that in the chat and we'll open a breakout room for you as well um, as always we are all still getting used to zoom um, and what that looks like so there might be a few tech hiccups or different things throughout the day but feel free to enjoy the fellowship or training that's happening in the main room while you're waiting to get sent to your breakout rooms throughout the day so there will always be something going on while you're waiting to get to that next space um, Marissa is also going to be recording all educational sessions so that they can be shared out after the conference. And we hope this is a really helpful tool for you to be able to keep these trainings and share them with brothers who you might want to share these ideas with afterwards. Um, kind of how this conference came to be, so you'll have those details, is we know that we're all facing new challenges and opportunities with recruitment. Um, some new and different than ever before, and others might be the same struggles we've always had, and we're trying to look at it in a different light. Um, and so since spring recruitment plans were requested, by Rob Coop, we thought it would be a really good idea um, to provide a space where you can have education and collaboration and kind of do that amazing work together that we know um, you want to do and you can do. So that's really the goal of today is to give you the training, the opportunity and the space to really develop great spring recruitment plans that you're excited about. So there might be concepts or ways of approaching recruitment that you have not encountered before today. And if you don't understand something that is completely okay, we're here to engage in conversation and grow together and no question at all is off limits. And we know you're fully capable of doing this and we're excited to collaborate and partner with you as we bring these plans to life. Um, and so Marissa is also going to go ahead and drop the spring recruitment planning guide in the chat during this next hour. And this is really helpful. It has a lot of relevance for today, um, but it also has a lot of relevance for when you're planning your spring recruitment. And so that way you have that resource on hand and you can use it whenever you need. Um, our few notes. Um, first of all, we want you to be camera ready. That does not mean you need to look fancy, but feel ready um, to share your like 
itself on camera. We want this, especially during fellowships, um, to really, in round tables, to really feel like we are in person and we're in a community. So get cozy, get excited. Uh, we want to make sure it really feels like we are having the same type of collaboration that we would in an in-person conference as much as possible. And final note, uh, this conference is primarily for you, the student, and we want students to be the focus of any conversation. So if you're an alum, we're really excited to have you here, and we would love for you to passively participate, but we wanna focus on active members when it comes to who we're calling on and some examples. Um, Marissa and Brandon, do you have any other things that need to be added? Okay, so with that, um, we are super excited to have you here and we're gonna go ahead and get started with the very first session, which is called, What is Our Value? And the wonderful Megan Sheffy is going to share her screen for that. So, um, uh, is my audio better than it was, by the way? I think I was really quiet earlier. Okay, fantastic. That works fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending. So, we're going to talk about the first question that we're going to go over is talking about what is our value. And Tara and I have had a lot of discussions about how we don't want anybody to think any of their questions are frivolous or stupid or any anything that you ask is is legitimate and we want to be able to answer anything that you're that you're looking to get out of today. And as an example of that, we've sort of said like, what is the most basic question that we could ask about recruitment or about the fraternity? And we said, what is our value? What is the purpose of the fraternity? And if that is not a basic question that we are unwilling to answer, if it's the first thing that we're starting out with in the first hour, then any question is open for us to answer to you throughout the day. So please, please chat in your questions. Please avail yourselves of any opportunities to speak with people one-on-one -on -one as well. Um, so yeah, what is our value? Um, so on the agenda today, so uh, first we're going to talk about like what the concept of value is in general. I want to make sure that we have similar um, definitions or a common definition of that term. Then we're going to have each of us explore what value APO has given us. Then, uh, so Tara is going to cover those two things. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what a value proposition is. And then uh, moving into talking about how do we articulate our value, basically how do we talk about it to potential new members. Um, and then Tara is going to move into talking about how we demonstrate our value. And I just want to say the one thing that I didn't that uh, you know Tara asked me if I wanted to mention something else. The the content of all of these um, trainings has been derived. I talked to all 18 of your regional chairs over the course of the the first week in November, and they sort of expressed that this was a common concern for folks. Like, how do we articulate what we're talking about? How do we how do we quote unquote, sell the fraternity to people who are looking to come into it. Um, so we wanted to start off with that concept because we thought that was sort of at the, at the heart of everything that we did. Um, so I'm gonna move over to Tara and she's gonna talk about value uh, and how what we've gotten out of the fraternity. Perfect, okay, so we're gonna start with just the concept of value and what that tends to look like. Um, so the first thing I think a lot of us think about is just the things we value, the things we are taught to value. And so that list often includes family, friends, and pets, our morals, the things that guide us and drive us, our education. Um, Alpha Phi Omega is obviously something all of us value if we are here today. Uh, good food, I think we all agree good food is great um, and laughter and I'm sure there are many things that we could add to this list and so we wanted to start with the idea of what we value and what that looks like so with that we're going to go into the definition of what is value so value is the regard for something 
um, is held to deserve the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. So what we feel like deserves to be seen as important. Um, and then a person's principles or standard, standards of behavior are also often referred to as a value, one's judgment for what is important in life and what holds value in life. So now that we have defined value and looked at that from a larger perspective, we're going to go into what value Alpha Phi Omega has given us um, as we build out how to share that. So now we're looking at what value Alpha Phi Omega has given us. Um, and so what we would like y'all to do is if everyone can either take out a digital place to type or a piece of paper and a pen. Um, so I'm going to give you a minute to do that. If everyone can do that real quick. All right. And once y'all have that, I want you to just take five minutes to think about these two questions. What drew you to Alpha Phi Omega to begin with? And what value has Alpha Phi Omega given you throughout your active experience? So I'm going to give you five minutes to think about those answers and go ahead and write them down. And I was going to say, and please do write them down because uh, we will be referring back to this throughout the presentation and also throughout the day. I see a few people still writing and typing. So I'm gonna give y'all one more minute and then I think we're in a pretty good place to go ahead. It's always funny how you know people are writing because everybody's head does that like similar tilt. <laughs> The writing tilt. Tara, what drew you to the APO? Good question. So um, for these questions, for AFIO for you. <laughs> 
what drew me to Alpha Phi Omega and the value it's given me are very different. Um, so what drew me to Alpha Phi Omega was I was an orientation leader and I followed an orientation captain named Kevin into a room because I thought he was cute and he had pizza and he said, come with me. And so that is literally <laughs> how I learned about Alpha Phi Omega is I followed someone I thought was attractive with pizza into a room. Um, but then when I got there, obviously I learned about who Alpha Phi Omega is and that drew me in enough to join. But the value is why I'm still here and the value of what it's given me throughout my active experience and since then, um, when I drill down into why I actually joined, it probably wasn't for Kevin, as great as Kevin was. Um, it was because I was looking for a community where I went in, in a time where I really needed that space and I needed an understanding of who I was and I felt like I didn't have that. And so I came from a place where I was in charge of a lot of things and I was doing service all the time and I felt like I understood community and leadership well. Um, but then I found out by Omega and understood that that process had just started for me and that journey had just started for me. Um, so that's kind of what drew me versus the value and really the difference between the two. Does anyone want to share what drew them to Alpha Phi Omega to begin with and then what value it's given them? I've gone because I just wanted to find a community. Like mm -hmm. I, and like as a sophomore and obviously just didn't have that much time to meet anyone second semester. And also I'm an Eagle Scout, so it just seemed like a logical continuation. Like, hey, APO, like it's sort of like the Boy Scouts except in college and with less camping. Yeah. And as for the value which I got out of it, um, I feel like it's given me a lot more opportunities to gain leadership and like as is, like I literally just went from being a like a pledge this semester to now membership vice president. So I feel like it's really given me a lot of opportunities to just to just learn how to organize things and yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. That was a great example. Does anyone else want to share? I'll share. Um so I kind of have a similar story to Tara. What drew me was a, a Rush Week event with frozen yogurt involved, and it was 96 degrees on campus. So I was all down for that. Um, and then I ended up deciding to join pretty much on the spot with one of my best friends, who is now my roommate. Um, but one of the values that I've learned throughout my active experience is probably approachability. I'm the vice president now of membership for my fraternity, and I take that role very, very seriously. Um, I always want to be somebody who's approachable, um, whether that be somebody who's interested in learning about Alpha Phi Omega or one of my active brothers uh, currently right now. So that's probably a role that I take very, very seriously and I have learned approachability. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing for both of you. Uh, those were wonderful examples. So when we talk about what brought us to Alpha Phi Omega and what value it's given us, um, we all likely joined for very different reasons that fall somewhere on this graphic that you see in front of you of fellowship, leadership, service on the next slide. Um, and the or that blue space in between right so we joined for we we're looking for fellowship opportunities to really find a community right or we joined because we wanted leadership experience or we joined because we saw value in service and wanted to get more involved in that um and so we all fall likely somewhere in that graph and we are likely though to stay for reasons that really encompasses more than just the reason we joined um if i had stayed only for Kevin, um, I would have left the next semester when Kevin graduated. So <laughs> that's obviously not the reason I stayed. Um, and so I think it's really valuable when we're talking about recruitment to help people imagine what it looks like to have that space in between. We may have been drawn to Alpha Phi Omega for leadership, friendship, or service, or pizza, or frozen yogurt, or scouts but we stayed here for the true authentic value that Alpha Phi Omega has given us. Yeah, so going along with the concept of value, we're gonna introduce probably, if you're a business or marketing student or you know, just in general, uh, there's this idea of value proposition. And every, every organization, every business needs to have what we're calling a value proposition. So, um, 
uh, on the next slide, we're going to give you a definition of what that is. So a value proposition is a promise of value to be delivered, communicated, and acknowledged. So when we're doing recruitment, we need to not only have our understanding of the value in our own minds, but we need to be able to articulate it in a way where people who are interested in the organization or interested in joining will be able to receive it and be able to understand exactly what we're talking about when we talk about the value. Um, so we want a value proposition statement. Now, we're going to talk to, I'm going to talk to you all about a, sort of an overarching value proposition for the fraternity in general. Um, something I talked to folks at the national office about last night, though, is that every single chapter is going to have its own individual and unique value proposition that abuts our national value proposition. So throughout this, like I said, I'm going to be talking really nationally and really broadly, but be thinking about like your chapter specifically, think about the events that you do, how you're organized, um, what your brotherhood is like, etc. And be thinking about what the particular value proposition is of your chapter as well, because that'll vary completely as we go across the country. All right. So Tara already said, generally what we have found is that when I've talked to students over, you know, uh, the last 10 years that I've been an alumni volunteer, we've found that most students come for either leadership, friendship, and or service to the fraternity. So like uh, Tara and I both joined because we thought a boy was cute, so that's entertaining. Like that's probably not the right reason. Colin Milne, who was the membership chair before me, joined because his because he somebody told him that there were free donuts. Like there are a bunch of different reasons why people uh, come in. I just want to say as a, as a sort of a side note here, when we're talking about, you know, sort of like, I, I know that there's this long-standing conversation in the fraternity about having quality pledges. And I just want to note that like Tara and I are like some of the most prominent people in the, in the membership part of the organization. And we joined because a boy was cute. So don't, don't, don't shut people down just because you feel like their motivation may not be, uh, may not be what you think that it should be. Um, but like I said, most of us come in for leadership, friendship, or service, but I don't think that that ultimately is why we stay in its own individual lane. So again, we need to be thinking about what value do we offer our members, but also more broadly, like the campuses that we operate on and the communities that we exist within. Value transcends all of those things. Now, when we're talking about value, uh, when it comes to recruitment, oftentimes it's about phrasing it within the context of how will your membership be valuable to you as a potential new member. But thinking about the campuses that we impact and the communities that we impact is also important in the context of that conversation. So Tara and I uh, talked about other organizations and sort of what they bring forth to the table. And ultimately what we've we have discussed is there are other organizations that because of a singular focus on leadership, friendship, or service. So here we have like Toastmasters under leadership, which is a, an organization where you uh, basically practice speeches and, and whatnot. Uh, friendship, which could be something like a typical Panhellenic Greek organization or an interest-based club, say it's like a hiking club or something like that, or like you knit scarves or whatever you do. That's like primarily on interest. And then with service, Circle K, specifically something like Habitat for Humanity, which I was involved with uh, quite a bit when I was in college. Each of these organizations, because they have a singular focus, may be able to provide a level of depth in each of these areas that maybe that could have the potential to be deeper than the fraternity itself. And that's just by virtue of the way in which they're constructed, right? Like. Habitat is almost exclusively, when you go out on a build for Habitat for Humanity, when you're building a house, of course you wind up bonding with the people that you're with. Of course there's friendship that gets developed in that. But the intention of the organization is not to be developing those friendships. The intention of the organization, the value of the organization is what it does more broadly in service. Same thing, like I said, with friendship and leadership. So, um, the depth factor can sometimes be bigger. So I don't think that when it comes to the fraternity, our strongest value proposition is sort of like concentrating on one of these particular things. Instead, and we'll go to the next slide, the true value of the fraternity is 
that it sits at the intersection of leadership, friendship, and service. So as you saw in like previous graphics that we put up, those things were sort of individualized because when we come into the organization, oftentimes we're coming in for one of those singular things. But I think it's important to acknowledge that the value is actually, like I said, straight in the center of all of this stuff. And Tara and I have talked about how we were sort of trying to articulate, you know, what, what sort of like captures the idea at the center. Part of it is that we said it's community. Community is at the heart of all of these things. You cannot be a leader if you don't have people to lead. You cannot be a friend if you don't have people to befriend. And you can't do service without a community that you are trying to do service for. So community, I think, is really at the heart of everything that we do. We talk about community service, but we do community leadership and we also do community friendship. Um, and I think understanding that value of the organization and understanding that we're trying to build holistic people who have value in leadership, friendship, and service, and where those things relate to each other, um, mutually reinforce each other, because all of them are in service, leadership, or friendship to the community, really can help you articulate better to pledges, or not pledges, but to, to potential new members, what the value of the organization is. It's all three of those things, all working together, all at the same time. And the, the way that we've really articulated that is on the next slide, where we said, I, we've all heard this before, uh, hopefully. We've heard leadership, friendship, and service bound by a single tie. How fine may, may we always be? Um, but I think oftentimes what we do when we're talking, when we're trying to quote unquote sell the organization or recruit people into the organization, we concentrate on the leadership, friendship, and service part. But the most important thing in my mind, actually, in this statement, and that's the sort of argument we're advancing to you, is that the bound by a single tie piece of this is actually the most important thing in the context of this conversation. It's not that we just do leadership. It's not that we just do friendship. It's not that we just do service. It's that we bind all of those things together in a meaningful way where they mutually reinforce each other and they, influence each other in profound ways. I think the way that we do service is influenced by the fact that we are a cohesive brotherhood of people who have similar values with each other and have care and compassion for each other. I think we become better leaders. We have the whole servant leadership model in the fraternity. I think the reason that we do leadership is be, or that we wanna be leaders is because we wanna be of better service to people. It's not that any of these things exist in a bubble. Like I said, they're all bound up together. So uh, we've composed sort of like a general value or value proposition here. Obviously this can be altered. This is not like, uh, you know, biblical or something like that. This isn't sort of like what you have to fall back on, but we wanted to have something articulated. So here we said, Alpha Phi Omega offers our members opportunities to engage in leadership development, community service and fellowship with one another. We recognize that our cardinal principles of leadership, friendship and service are not only equal, but are important parts of a comprehensive fraternity experience that develops our members in community focus, again, that word community, interrelated and holistic ways that will serve them throughout the rest of their lives. And again, we encourage you to come up with a value statement and a value proposition for your own chapter, but I think this sort of gets us on the start, right? This, 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 is the, this is where we can begin that conversation with people who are interested. And I know based on a lot of conversation with a lot of students over the years, sometimes this is the most difficult thing to figure out. This should always be brief. You should know what your value proposition is in a, in a short bite. Um, you know, this is only two sentences. Um, but if you can articulate the value, then you're already way beyond uh the beginning of the conversation right like it's the foundation but it's a pretty thick foundation uh for recruitment going forward all right so that's all well and good you say brandon but like how do we actually like articulate this to people outside from just telling them the value proposition because if all i do is like walk up to somebody and say that uh then that's going to be really weird and they're probably not going to be that engaged um, and it's not, that's not emotional, right? That's not personal. That's, 
that's articulating a value proposition because it gives you a it gives you a base, like I said, by which to talk about the fraternity. But you know, where's the, where's the pizzazz that it comes when you're talking about recruitment? How do I like? How does it touch my heart and not just my head? Um, so we want to talk to you about like how do you meaningfully articulate that value in conversations that you're going to have as part of recruitment as well. So how now do we express the value we have as an organization to potential new members? So there's a variety of ways that we already do that. We have marketing and branding materials. Like I said, Tara's over not just the recruitment subcommittee, but also they cover branding. Um, you can see this is like a nice slide deck that Marissa has put together and designed. Uh, so that's part of what we do. Social media campaigns are part of marketing and branding. That's how we talk about our value. You know, we sort of like put up images of brothers. Um, you know, we can like live stream, we can do like Instagram live, we can TikTok from like, a, like our service events and stuff that helps promote who we are. Uh, it gives that like genuine sense of involvement, even if you're not there at the time. We engage in one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who are potential new members who are interested in coming in. We have info sessions or informational events. I think almost all of our chapters do that. Uh, and then quote unquote, we have these things called elevator speeches. And I really wanna hammer in on the elevator speeches component of this as we move through the talking about articulating. So if you're not familiar with the concept of what an elevator speech is, and if you are, uh, there's a reason that I'm going over it even for you, because I wanna make sure that we're clear on it. These are typically what are thought of as brief snippets. The idea being that this is a story allegedly that you should be able to tell somebody uh, or a speech that you should be able to give over the course of roughly five minutes, um, like you were riding up and down on an elevator. Now, I don't know what elevator somebody is on, A, where it takes five minutes to get between places, unless you're uh, like on like you know, the Seer, the formerly known Sears Tower or something like that. I don't know what elevator you're on. And I don't know who's given a speech in an elevator because I like, all I do is like look at the walls and pretend like nobody else exists when I'm in an elevator with other people. So I don't know what this came from, but elevator speech, five minutes, roughly. Generally in this, we're told to figure out what our personal story is and to be able to tell that to somebody. What is my experience in the fraternity? and I'm going to bestow that story upon you. And then at the end, there's always a call to action that is supposed to happen. It's supposed to be, you know, now that you've heard my story, um, we really encourage you to uh, get involved with Alpha Phi Omega so you can develop your own story going forward. So that's sort of like the basic overall structure of an elevator speech. And it's very rehearsed, generally. You know exactly what you're supposed to say. Again, so because we all come in with our own value, because we all come in with the thing that we want, or we stay for the same or for a reason, generally our speeches, I have found when I've talked to students, fall along the lines of leadership, friendship, or service. There's a concentration in that elevator speech on the thing that matters to you, right? You talk about, um, like one of my elevator speeches, uh, which I'm still very attached to is, I had, um, my, I went to Center College in Kentucky, a uh, tiny little liberal arts college, 1400 people in, in Danville, Kentucky, which is like a hotbed of COVID at the moment, I guess. Um, but where is it besides Hawaii? Um, so uh, I used to go to an animal shelter every Friday and there, was, there were these two dogs named Duke and Daisy. They were, they were siblings and uh, had been involved in dog fighting, which is really horrifying. And they got rescued from a dog fighting ring and uh, were terrified of people, just terrified. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of service anyway with people, but there was something about going over the course of three years and eventually like those dogs coming to trust us uh, coming up and like, like Daisy by the end would like run up to you. She would be so excited. Um, and then like sad turn of events toward the end of my time at Center, Daisy passed away. But I, I think about like how horrible the start of her life was and like how joyous it was toward the end. And that to me really like 
the innocence of that really articulated for me like what the value of service was because I can get that from people as well but there's something about like an animal learning how to trust a human when they're like bred to trust us <laughs> and they didn't to begin with um, that I thought was really impactful. So that was sort of my elevator speech for a long time even though I would say I didn't join for service obviously. Uh, so again they kind of fall along these lines usually. But what I want to encourage everybody is to think about the problems that actually exist with elevator speeches. Um, in the way that I just talked about, often they don't value the tie. They don't talk about the value of the tie that binds those things together. They're very segmented into leadership, friendship, or service generally. And they're usually articulated in a way where we're talking about the principle that resonates most with us. Second problem is, again, like this whole idea of like bestowing a story upon somebody is that they're self-focused. And rather than considering why the potential new member is coming to us, we're talking about why we are there and we may not be co-constructing something with them where they can see themselves in the story that we're talking about. And it's not about that. We've already been recruited. We're trying to get somebody else to join. And like I said earlier, it can feel overly scripted. I think at a time when marketing specifically by lots of major companies is about organic interaction and organic sharing and it seeming organic even when it's not, uh, that whole overly scripted thing feels very like early 2000s um, and can be really off-putting and seem disingenuine. So instead of talking about elevator speeches, we want to encourage people uh, to think about what is your values-driven personal story. So we're tossing out the elevator speech thing just for a second and thinking about what is at the intersection, what story do we have that is at the intersection and can speak to leadership, friendship, and service? If people recruits, potential new members are coming into the organization, they're coming by your info sessions, they're talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, and they could be coming for leadership, friendship, or service. You don't know, right? Like you don't know before they start talking to you. We think that your story, whatever that story is, should be able to speak to all three of those things, but also demonstrate the potential that somebody can have to value those other two things perhaps more than they do already. So it's a reflection of the, your story is a reflection of what they're coming in for, but it's also an expansion because you can talk about leadership and friendship if they're coming in for service, something like that. So you're like, well, what the hell does that look like, Brandon? So there's steps to this that I wanna, that we wanna lay out. So when you're constructing what we're calling a values-driven personal story, is settle on a core story. So I want you all to take the opportunity to look back at what you wrote down a little bit earlier, why you joined and why you have continued to stay. That probably is your core story. That's the thing that makes the most sense to you. And then consider how that story can connect with all three principles of the fraternity, leadership, friendship, and service and the importance that community has in all three of those things. So the tie that binds those three things is community. Then what you wanna do is you wanna develop alternative, authentic, and responsive ways of telling that story depending on who you encounter and what those people value. So it's not about like having a disingenuous story or like, making up three different stories to relate to leadership, friendship, or service. It's, it's actually trying to seek out the value within your own story that is connected to all three of these things and demonstrates how they all work together. Then you wanna, so that's, that's, the, that's what you do on your own, right? That's, that's, the, that's the side work that you do. That's the work that you do uh, as a chapter with each other. That's how you help each other. You say, hmm, I didn't, I don't, I don't know how that relates to leadership. You can give each other meaningful feedback about what you do. This is sort of done without the potential new members around. Then when you actually get into these conversations, it's not about leading with your own story, right? It's about leading by asking them 
why are you coming to APO? Like, what are, what are you doing? Like, what are you seeking? What matters to you? And they might say something like, um, you know, I'm a freshman on campus and I'm just looking to, you know, I'm looking for a community. A few folks said, like, folks often say that, or, oh, I'm looking to make some new friends. Um, or I was in Boy Scouts and I really enjoyed doing community service for them and I want to continue to do it in that way. Or um, I'm a really shy person. I heard that there's like leadership development opportunities and I want to have the capacity to like, you know, get up in front of people and not be scared. <laughs> I'm scared to do that, right? That, what they tell you, frames the way in which your story gets told. What you want to do, like I said, is reflect the value that they bring forward. What is the value that they are seeking? And how can your story, how can you personally tie that back to your own experience? But then simultaneously, like I said, it's also about showing them the future personal potential that they have in telling their story. So like I said, if somebody came to me for a friendship and I said, oh, I had some friends in the chapter and I thought a boy was cute. Like if I say that, it's that's not enough, right? That that doesn't, if somebody's coming in for service, they might think, oh, I don't hear myself in that story. Oh, I don't, I don't know that. I don't see that. Versus me thinking, okay, where is the service story that I have? I think when it comes to the conversation about Daisy, for instance, like there's obviously a major service component to that, but there's also like the the value of the community that I had one. I mean, the same group of people basically went every Friday. We became really close. We all had to drive together. We laughed a lot. And then leadership was we were constantly rotating who was in charge for that week. We were saying like who who doles out the tasks, and it was about like helping people develop when they went to the to the service project. So we can tap into leadership, friendship, and service. And also, like I said, more broadly, the whole concept of community, because we were going out and serving the community, but also had our own community internally. Regardless of that, you still want that call to action at the end. You should always want a call to action at the end. You should always be encouraging people to go the next step, think about joining, think about coming to the next event, something like that. So I want all of you again to look back at what you, what brought you to APO or AFIO or AFIQ or whatever you say, Alpha Phi Omega, um, and what the value is that it has given you. So, so look at your stories right now. Look at what you wrote down. Consider the ways in which your story connects to leadership, friendship, and service, and start to develop a values-driven personal story. Now, uh, we were going to practice a bit, but we maybe run it. We want to make sure that we're do getting done about 10 till for every hour. So you guys have some time to chill and relax for before the next session starts. So maybe we'll continue to move uh, a little bit past this. Um, but there will be an opportunity. I think it's the, um, there's a fellowship session later on in the day where we're going to be returning back to this. We're going to be asking you to share your values-driven personal story if you take part in that fellowship event. So do be thinking about this. Think about working on it because we want to make sure that we're prepared for that uh, if you choose to participate in that session later on. I think that's the one-on-one -on -one session at three o'clock. Is it at three o'clock? Um, there's some other things going on during that time as well, other population roundtables and whatnot. But um, yeah, we'll come back to that uh, a bit later on. So now that we have talked about sharing our stories and what that piece looked like, we wanted to go into the practical of how do we demonstrate our value, especially on the recruitment side, events, things like that. So that's where we're heading now. And for a traditional recruitment event, um, as you'll see, it typically falls into one area. So maybe you are doing an ice cream social or a progressive dinner, and that's obviously going to be mostly focused on fellowship. Or maybe you are offering launch to potential new members or a skill sharing event or personal development training of some kind. Obviously, that's heavy on leadership. Um, and then with service, maybe you are doing a volunteer day, a campus cleanup, something like that. 
Um, and that is traditionally going to really just stay in that service area. And then often what we see with info sessions traditionally is it's kind of its own bubble that can even be off the map um, in a lot of ways because we tend to focus on like, hey, these are the facts, right? This is what you need to do to join. Um, and so this is what we tend to see from a traditional recruitment event. And then in the next slide, what we really want to focus on um, is instead looking at an event as a values driven recruitment event um, and really focusing on that centerpiece. So with everything we're doing, what does it look like to look at it through the lens of fellowship or leadership or service and really the core of that is every single thing we do should be developing this authentic community in some way right should be developing like who we are and who we are going to be for those potential new members if our event is just leadership development it might be an amazing event and that's great but if we don't talk about who we are at any point, if we don't give opportunity for there to be authentic fellowship or community building or talk about what we do from a service standpoint at any point in that, then people are gonna come in not fully understanding who we are and what that looks like. And so it's really important to focus on that center and how we can develop holistic events. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, I think, I think what's important to note about that, especially for chapters that, you know, there there isn't a specific number of events or something that somebody has to show up to. It's it's vital that they get exposure to leadership, friendship, and service because if we're saying that that is the value of the organization and they only show up to a leadership event, they may have not as strong of an understanding of the organization that they're actually joining. They don't understand the value, or they're not having the opportunity to actually live it out. They may be hearing about it but we want them to have that experience. Exactly. So when we look at recruitment outcomes, um, these are all different outcomes. There will be different times where we'll talk about each of these. Also, look out for more resources coming soon on how to build your chapter's recruitment outcomes. Um, but today we're really focusing on comprehensive, comprehensive exposure to leadership, fellowship, and service and developing events and activities that help people really get to know Alpha Phi Omega instead of just one piece of the cardinal principles. So for this, um, these are some steps we laid out for you all just to make this process easier because sometimes it doesn't look like starting over, right? Like if you don't have a focus of an event, it can be all over the place or it could not have value in itself. And so we want you to start with what you know, start with what you think will be valuable and helpful. And so we want you to start with just considering your chapter's recruitment outcomes and goals. So once you have set what your outcomes are and what your goals are, then brainstorm as a group any initial ideas for an event. We're talking literally any idea, like get crazy with it. The sky's the limit as long as like, you know, budget wise, it wouldn't be ridiculous, right? Um, but like, brainstorm whatever you want um, as a chapter as a committee whatever this looks like get every single idea out there that you possibly can and then determine which events of that list speak to leadership fellowship and service or for those who don't can they and what does that look like um, and so with that just asking the questions how can this help potential new members understand our idea of leadership? How can this event help potential new members understand our idea of service? How can this event help potential new members understand idea of fellowship? How is this event building community? Just those four questions can truly help you create any event in a way that's more holistic and understanding of who Alpha Phi Omega is. And all of a sudden your game night that was super fun and maybe gets people really excited, but they don't fully understand what they're excited about now becomes an opportunity for them to get like, Oh, I got to see a bunch of people's different leadership styles and the way we did those games. 
And that was really helpful for me to understand that I'm going to develop as a leader and as a person through this. So really just finding that way to create events where they can see themselves in these principles. And then you're going to plan the event with that tie in mind. So instead of just staying in one arena or the other, planning one that brings it back to that centerpiece, and then reflecting at the very end, once you've created the event and you feel good about it, reflecting on is your planned event representative of all three and the tie between them, and then edit or reconceive if necessary and just continue to work through that process. Again, it's really as simple as just asking from the beginning what our outcomes and goals are, getting crazy with it, like have fun. <laughs> and then when you're tying it together, truly asking yourself those four questions about leadership, friendship, service, and the tie between. So here are some examples of ways that, let's say, especially for the spring, I am assuming that there's a decent amount of y'all who have a plan, right? Like you have things in place, you have things that you're working on. Um, and so we wanted to also just provide ways that you could make an event at least like show who we are in some capacity and be a little bit more holistic. So for example, if your event was a fellowship event, um, then maybe that looks like having a service focused icebreaker at the beginning. So it could be as easy as what kind of service did you do in high school? What, um, what's a area of service you're passionate about? What is a issue that you're passionate about? You can ask a lot of different things, um, have time to share those things and, it might be a really good opportunity where, you know, a potential can see themselves in something that a brother says um, and really develop a new friendship or a connection through that. Um, and then maybe with friendship, it looks like leadership development games for part of this. So maybe there's some strategy games that are added if it was a game night, for example, or like I said before, maybe it's that if you play a game where there's a captain, the captain changes every time so that you really have a space to develop that leadership and talk about it, right? Like anything you're doing, add that element of debrief instead of just leaving it at the surface. If it was a service focused event, then maybe you add things like small groups. Um, maybe you have get to know you questions that your chapter has talked about ahead of time that are just like available. So if you are, um, virtually knitting together, right? Um, then maybe you are talking while you're doing that. You have ideas of like how to get conversations started. You have prompts, things ready to go to really get to know each other instead of just sitting in silence or listening to a how-to video and that being the only thing happening. Um, maybe it looks like a reflection post-event. So if you're doing heavy service, um, then maybe afterwards you're adding in that leadership focus by really reflecting on what you did and why you did it instead of leaving it at that uh, basic area of just doing the service. Um, and then maybe after a service event, you're doing dinner or coffee or virtual dinner or virtual coffee all together um, and talking about what you just did and just leaving that space for people to hang out and get to know each other. Um, and then maybe that looks like assigning leaders to events small groups so that they get to know each other better. And then with leadership focus, it might look like event planning, um, managing events, um, being like more on that fun end, right? Like adding the fellowship opportunity pieces to those events, um, having a community partner fair where that service, you're getting to know people from the community um, and you're getting to know people's events. You are being in fellowship just by talking to one another, right? So just really unique ways to kind of flip these on their head. And then for info sessions, info sessions, we really want to sit at the exact center of leadership, fellowship, and service, and they should really represent all three principles, as well as the tie that binds them together. So an easy way to do that is like those stories that we talked about at the very beginning, and anything that provides a space for people to have one-on-one -on -one conversations that are truly about the potential new member and providing space for them to understand if Alpha Phi Omega is a good fit for them and for them to understand if they can see 
their future in Alpha Phi Omega and what that looks like. So we're really providing space for them to just like imagine what it would be like to be a part of our chapter. And ask yourself anytime you're planning an info session, have we incorporated leadership, fellowship, and service into our info session? And really thinking beyond the information slides that describe the chapter's programs. Uh, like I said before, I think that's the biggest thing that we really get stuck on is we want to get the information out and that is valuable and that is important. But if we stay there, then we're not giving them the reason why we're just giving them how, and we really need that why piece for people to feel like they can imagine themselves as a part of us. And now we're going to transition to Brandon to close it out. Yeah, so I think, you know, something that, that in designing this and talking about this that we we spoke a lot about, Tara, was like the, you know, the tie, I think because we've all been, most of us have been in the fraternity for, you know, at least a semester. I mean, everybody's been in it for at least a period of time because you, you uh, were a pledge or, or an incoming member or however you want to term that, depending on your campus. Um, the the tie is the thing that becomes latent it's sort of the thing that you sort of like that fades into the back of your mind and i think um this is really about making sure that it's front and center um and also making sure that anybody who's coming into the organization they don't have the experiences that you all have already they're looking to see what those experiences will be like so modeling those as part of recruitment like tara was saying not just about going over what are the requirements which is obviously important we need people to know those things but we don't just want them to like learn about what our service program is right we want them to have some degree of participation and i think when it comes to info sessions those sometimes are some of our best attended things because people are looking to get that information so giving them a lived experience as part of that information session having a leadership game having the opportunity to engage and get to know each other in some sort of friendship capacity maybe even incorporating some aspect of service uh like doing an actual service event something small there um can i think have a lot more value uh than just sort of saying this is it's about saying this is what we do overall and here's an example of what we're going to do in this current moment so think more broadly be more imaginative i know it's a crazy time with covid and, and most of us being virtual a lot of people have done an incredible job modifying what they're doing um, and throughout the day, we're going to be demonstrating some fellowship opportunities that you can use, modeling those to you if you choose to participate in those. Um, we're going to give ideas for how to conduct uh, more engaging information sessions, more engaging social media campaigns, et cetera. So there's going to be a lot more practical stuff throughout the day. Um, but this, like I said, is laying the groundwork uh, for where we're coming for the rest of the day. So I know this was a lot of us talking. That's like not the most exciting thing in the world. We're literally not modeling what we told you to do. but <laughs> we'll do a groundwork for about this first 50 minutes and then for the rest of the day it'll be a lot more about engaging with each other uh, and a lot more uh, participatory so um, if you have any questions uh, we have about we'll have about 10 minutes before the next session starts to get everybody in their breakout rooms you can take a break I'm probably going to make more coffee because it's like not even eight in the morning uh, here. Um, so uh, feel free to do that. Write in um, any questions that you have into the chat. We're happy to respond to those. Um, yeah, and uh, I hope this was this was helpful for everybody uh, for the first hour. So again, thank you everybody for being here.